Michael from 8565. Today he's going to be talking about using the common filter for better localization. So Michael, take it away. We'll pay you money for broke as hell. Hi, this is about the common filter and how you can use it to improve your localization with like real like an Excel. Hey, yeah, I'm Michael. Uh, I'm a freshman going to St. Mark's, so that's pretty cool. So, what is localization? Some of you may not know, but that's perfectly okay. It's essentially just figuring out where your robot is on the field. For example, you might be, I don't know, 10 inches away from the center of the field. So, it's, again, just figuring out where you are on the field. So, some teams, they like to use odometry or drive encoders to figure this out or motion profile like it varies like road owner or pure pursuit, which just do the math for them. So we have a problem here. We want to figure out how far our robot has traveled. And we're only giving we're only given an encoder which tells us how many times it's spun and a wheel attached to it with along with the circumference. So how do we use these two to figure out how far the robot has traveled? Simple. We simply Multiply the wheel circumference by the number of rotations, reaching a reliable distance that we can use to track our robot's location, right? Actually, no, because our wheel's slick. I don't know if you've seen this in like racing, but a lot of drivers, they like to drift. And similarly, in robotics, your robot will drift over time, causing inaccuracies in the encoder or odometry's reading. So we can solve this by simply just taking another form of measurement. So if you were like driving down a highway and you were using your odometer to find out how far you've traveled, you could also use the road signs as another way to figure out how far you've traveled. So we're just gonna be using the distance sensors. We're gonna point them at the walls and using a little bit of trigonometry, figure out where our robot is on position on the field. But we have another problem. Our two inputs, they don't match each other. Our encoders say that we're at 61, 62, but our distance sensors say we're actually at 50, 50. So how do we know which one to trust? We use camel filters. So what is a camel filter, you might be asking? Well, it, like the name suggests, it filters these two inputs into one better input. The way it does it is using weights to compute a weighted average and it does this by calculating the level of uncertainty from these two inputs. So our first step is we need to predict. We take our robot's previous position and our new multiplied like encoder and wheel circumference, and we add these two to get our new estimated state. Then we take our, okay. Yeah, then we move on to the second step where we Taking our distance sensors and we figure out how far off our estimate was from the, our correction or innovation step. And then we also take the two uncertainties from both inputs and we use this to calculate our weight, our weight and our weighted average. And then finally, we take our weight and the two inputs and fuse them all together to get one better estimate. So we're gonna be using matrices to represent our robot state. If you don't know much about them, that's totally fine. All you need to know is that they just hold information about our, about our robot's position. So pretty much you, you can just do basic mathematical operations. And what we're gonna be using a lot in our presentation is one, the transpose of a matrix. And that's pretty much where you just flip the matrix over the axes. And then the other thing I'm gonna be using is like this tiny letter K. <clears throat> like below the matrix, and that's gonna denote the timestamps, which is pretty much our, our robot's pose at like timestamp K. So, oh, yeah. So this is the state space model. Essentially, this is our robot's estimation phase, where we take our robot's previous position, our new input, along with the sensor noise, and we add these all together to get our new estimate. Then we have the observation model. Instead of taking our robot's previous, previous estimate and the new input, we simply get immediately, we already have an observation telling us where our robot is on the field, also along with the sensor noise. <coughs> so here's where we introduce Gaussians. 
or Gaussians. Gaussians pretty much is, they're just like probability distributions. So why this is important is because, again, when we're dealing with the Kalman filter, we're trying to figure out the levels of uncertainty we are, or that the inputs carry. So we can represent <coughs> each input as a Gaussian. And the center of the curve will be our estimate with everything else just being maybe a probable estimate from what we think it is. <coughs> Sorry. So what variance is, is it's just another word for like uncertainty. And that's pretty much how spread out our probability distribution is, or Gaussian. So the more spread out the curve is, the more uncertain we are. And you can just represent this as covariance. <coughs> <coughs> so if we return back to our first step, we again just have our previous robot state along with the new measurement and the sensor noise, and we just use that to compute our estimate. Now to compute the uncertainty, we take our robot's previous uncertainty level along with the sensor noise, and we just add these two together. So if we go to our second step, again, we just find our robot's current or corrected pose, <coughs> along with the previous covariance and the sensor noise. So it's pretty much the exact same as this step, except instead of taking the robot's previous state, we already have a current state estimate. So this is where we compute the weight. We take our two levels of uncertainty and just multiply them together. If the weight is closer to one, it means that we trust our corrected estimate more. And if it's closer to zero, it means that we don't really trust the corrected estimate at all. So now this is where we fuse the two estimates. If all the steps before this was a little bit confusing, here's where you'll, you might find a little bit of sense in this presentation. We simply multiply the weight of our corrected estimate and add that to our estimated state. And we should get an in-between pose, like this red, red curve right here. So if this purple was our encoders and this black one was our distance sensors, we use a Kalman filter to get an in-between estimate based off the uncertainties. So after we've done all this, we need to update how uncertain or yeah, how uncertain the estimates are. For example, if we actually figure out at the end that our robots encoders are very inaccurate, then we need to update that instead of just having wrong data. So we can tune our Kalman filter. And why we need to do this is because our robots are all different. They have different weights, different weight distributions. So we need to figure out a way to tune this. So the way we can do this is by one, having a starting covariance. Your starting covariance will one, initialize where your robot position are, and it's essentially how confident we are and where the robot's exact position is at the beginning. Our second one is the state noise covariance. That pretty much represents how confident we are in the encoders covariance. And that's gonna be essential to how much we trust the encoders. And the same thing with the sensors. So here's some variations of the Kalman filter. We have the extended one, which is meant for non-linear systems, which is most of our robots. Because in real life, nothing is just a straight line. It's like a really weird squiggle. <laughs> and to do this, it pretty much just uses some calculus to calculate everything, which can sometimes be slow, which is why there's also the unscented Kalman filter. So instead of using calculus, the unscented Kalman filter, if you remember from the Gaussian, instead of just taking points from the mean or the estimate, we also take points from like from other points of the, on the Gaussian. Like instead of just the center peak, we can also take points around here to calculate one, our covariance or uncertainty and our estimate. So again, if all of this didn't make sense, hopefully this live demo would just show how everything works. Okay. Um, is the robot on, Anthony? <laughs> At least you don't have to download code this time. Okay, I'll turn this around, so... So 
if everything runs properly, wait, put the server station stuff in there. If everything runs properly, then it should just be, then the robot should run just like to about here in general. So that's like your standard Roadrunner path, right? So you might be asking, what's so special? So if you notice, I started my robot position here. So now I'm gonna move it somewhere over here where the starting position is actually wrong. And we're gonna see what happens when I run it in a different wrong position. It's still able to go to the same location, even though I started it in the wrong position because it's using the distance sensors to figure out what's wrong with the encoders and correct itself. Does anybody have any questions? Let's first get a round of applause. <laughs> Can you try it for another position? I mean, sure. <laughs> Hi. I guess this one was like a little bit even more wrong, but that's because the air was also bigger. Let me try something like here. Yeah, so it's like all around like the same location. Try it from here. Oh, okay. <laughs> the distance sensors are out of range, so it's just gonna like run over there. Or it's gonna give some super wrong value. So yeah, that's the other thing, I guess, since it's a good point that you brought it up. The common filter only works when like your distance sensors are in range of the wall or you have like an actual source of output. Or for example, if my distance sensors were like this, where only one distance sensor is in range of the wall, that wouldn't work either because we only know how far away it is from the wall, not where exactly along the wall it is, where it is. <coughs> so. It's important that we also know the exact location of the robot, not just in general where it is when you see the common filter. What about if you have another robot in your way? If you have another it's robot in your way, that, that's like, that's pretty much just autonomous defense. But let's say, I don't know, if something bumps your robot or your robot like hits a barrier and suddenly it's like off from its original path, it can use the common filter to fix that. What if I like push it while it's running? Um, then, actually, I haven't tried that, but you want to try it now? Okay, sure. <laughs> so you use it primarily in autonomous? Yeah, this is much for autonomous. Okay, let's like push it randomly. Actually, I don't know if it's going to work, but like... <laughs> we can try it, we can try it. Uh, well, that's because it's not the program, but like, you know, it was like fighting back. <laughs> you push it twice, that's all. Can that's it be turned? Huh? What if you turn it? Okay, well, if you turn it, that's a good point. Well, well if you turn it, right, it does the math based off the IMU's heading, so then it's just going to do a bunch of wrong math, so it's going to be wrong. But assuming that your IMU, like, at the start is, like, correct, <coughs> then it should run properly. So like, try pushing again, but only like once. Okay. Make it a good one. <laughs> okay, I'll give it a push. Mm. Oh, oh man. <laughs> Dang. I mean, okay. <laughs> but it was like, it's <laughs> close, it's close. So, what, in your experience, what has the greater amount of uh, error? Is it the odometry or the distance sensor? I mean, I think the distance sensors, they're like more accurate, but the other thing with the distance sensor is they don't update like as fast as the odometry. So the odometry updates like five or six times faster. So we also have to figure out like, maybe if the yeah, dis when we get the distance sensor reading, like it might be outdated compared to the odometry. So it, it varies. Which one would you trust more? By itself, I'd probably just choose the odometry, but again, odometry drifts over time in comparison to distance sensors. So both have downsides. Yeah. I mean, just, just like a comment, the way I see it, like, hopefully we can actually use odometry this way, this year, like, hopefully there's no barriers to like screw up your odometry. <laughs> then, then like, I found odometry is like pretty accurate, so 
you can kind of like trust the distance sensors less. And because odometry, they're like accurate to like one inch per 30 seconds, like one inch drift every 30 seconds. And like distance sensors can fix that, I think. But driving cutters on the other hand, they're like pretty bad. Yeah, they're pretty bad. So karma filter would have been really useful this year. Does anybody have any other questions? No? Okay, then. Let's give it up for Michael.